Something, somewhere, somewhen, must have happened differently. Petunia Evans married Michael Varis, a professor of biochemistry at Oxford. Harry James Potter Evans Varis grew up in a house filled to the brim with books. He once bit a math teacher who didn't know what a logarithm was. He's read Gödel, Escher, Bach, and Judgment Under Uncertainty, Heuristics and Biases, and Volume 1 of the Feynman Lectures on Physics. And despite what everyone who's met him seems to fear, he doesn't want to become the next Dark Lord. He was raised better than that. He wants to discover the laws of magic and become a god. Hermione Granger is doing better than him in every class, except broomstick riding. Draco Malfoy is exactly what you would expect an 11-year-old boy to be like if Darth Vader were his doting father. Professor Quirrell is living his lifelong dream of teaching defense against the dark arts, or as he prefers to call his class, battle magic. His students are all wondering what's going to go wrong with the defense professor this time. Dumbledore is either insane or playing some vastly deeper game which involves setting fire to a chicken. Deputy Headmistress Minerva McGonagall needs to go off somewhere private and scream for a while. Presenting Harry Potter and the Methods of Rationality. You ain't guessing where this one's going. It wasn't every day you got to see Harry Potter beg. Please? Fred and George shook their heads again, smiling. There was an agonized look on Harry Potter's face. But I told you how I did the one with Kevin Entwistle's cat, and Hermione and the Vanishing Soda, and I can't tell you about the Sorting Hat, or the Remember All, or Professor Snape! Fred and George shrugged and turned to leave. If you ever do figure it out, be sure to let us know! You're evil! You're both evil! Fred and George firmly closed the door to the empty classroom behind them and made sure to keep the grin on their faces for a while just in case Harry Potter could see through doors. I don't suppose Harry's guesses gave you any ideas? Their last relevant memory was a flume refusing to help them, though they couldn't remember what they'd asked him to do. But they must have looked elsewhere and found someone to help them to do something illegal or they wouldn't have agreed to be obliviated afterward. How had they possibly been able to get all that done on just 40 galleons? At first, they'd worried that they'd forged evidence so good that Harry actually would end up married to Ginny. But they'd thought of that too, it seemed. The Wizengamot proceedings had been tampered with again to put them back the way they'd been originally. The fake betrothal contract had vanished from its dragon-guarded vault in Gringotts, and so on. It was pretty scary, actually. Most people now thought the Daily Prophet had just made the whole thing up for unguessable reasons and the quibbler had helpfully twisted the knife deeper with the next day's headline, Harry Potter secretly betrothed to Luna Lovegood. Whoever they'd hired would tell them after the statute of limitations expired, they desperately hoped. But meanwhile it was awful, they'd pulled their greatest prank ever, maybe the greatest prank in the history of pranking, and they couldn't remember how. It was crazy, they'd been able to think of a way the first time, why couldn't they see it now after knowing everything they'd done? Their only consolation was that Harry didn't know they didn't know. Not even Mum had questioned them about it, despite the obvious Weasley connection. Whatever had been done, it was far out of reach of any Hogwarts student. Except possibly one who, if certain rumors were true, might have done it by snapping his fingers. Unsurprisingly, Rita Skeeter and the editor of the Daily Prophet had both vanished and were probably in another country by now. They would have liked to be able to tell their family about that part, Dad would have congratulated them, they thought, after Mum had finished killing them and Ginny had burned the remains. But everything was still alright, they'd tell Dad someday. And meanwhile... Meanwhile, Dumbledore had happened to sneeze while passing them in the hallway, and a small package had accidentally dropped out of his pockets, and inside had been two matched Wardbreaker monocles of incredible quality. The Weasley twins had tested their new monocles on the forbidden third room corridor, making a quick trip to the magic mirror and back, and they hadn't been able to see all the detection webs clearly, but the monocles had shown a lot more than they'd seen the first time. Of course, they would have to be very careful never to get caught with the monocles in their possession, or they would end up in the headmaster's office getting a stern lecture and maybe even threats of expulsion. It was good to know that not everyone who got sorted into Gryffindor grew up to be Professor McGonagall. Harry was in a white room, windowless, featureless, sitting before a desk, 
facing an expressionless man in formal robes of solid black. The room was screened against detection, and the man had performed exactly 27 spells before saying so much as, Hello, Mr. Potter. It was oddly appropriate that the man in black was about to try reading Harry's mind. A human mind, Harry's occlumency book had said, was only exposed to a legilimens along certain surfaces. If you failed to defend your surfaces, the legilimens would go through and be able to access any part of you which their own mind was able to comprehend. Which tended not to be much. Human minds, it seemed, were hard for humans to understand on any level but the shallowest. It was a sad commentary on how little human beings understood each other, how little any wizard comprehended the depths lying beneath the mind's surface, that you could fool the best human telepaths by pretending to be someone else. But then, human beings only understood each other in the first place by pretending. You didn't make predictions about people by modeling the hundred trillion synapses in their brain as separate objects. You predicted people by telling your brain to act like theirs. You put yourself in their place. The best social manipulator on Earth might not know what neurons were, and neither might the best legilimens. For once, just once, Harry hadn't gotten shortchanged in the mysterious powers department. After almost a month of work, and more on a whim than any real hunch, Harry had decided to make himself coldly angry and then try the book's occlumency exercises again. At that point, he'd mostly given up hope on that sort of thing, but it had still seemed worth a quick try. He'd run through all the book's hardest exercises in two hours, and the next day he'd gone and told Professor Quirrell he was ready. His dark side, it turned out, was very, very good at pretending to be other people. Harry's smile grew chillier, and he regarded the black-robed man who thought he was going to read Harry's mind. And then Harry turned into someone else entirely, someone who had seemed appropriate to the occasion. In a white room, windowless, featureless, sitting before a desk, facing an expressionless man in formal robes of solid black. Kimball Kinnison regarded the black-robed man who thought he was going to read the mind of a second-stage lensman of the Galactic Patrol. To say that Kimball Kinnison was confident of the outcome would be an understatement. He had been trained by Mentor of Arisia, the most powerful mind known to this or any other universe and the mere wizard sitting across from him would see precisely what the Grey Lensman wanted him to see. The mind of the boy he was currently disguised as, an innocent child named Harry Potter. I'm ready, said Kimball Kinnison in nervous tones that were exactly appropriate for an 11-year-old boy. Legilimens. There was a pause. Mr. Potter, it is good to know your advantages but that is not the same as being wildly overconfident in them. You may indeed be able to learn occlumency at 11 years of age. This astounds me. I had thought Mr. Dumbledore was pretending to be insane again. Your dissociative talent is so strong that I am surprised to find no other signs of childhood abuse and you may become a perfect occlumens in time. But there is a considerable difference between that and expecting to put up a successful occlumency barrier on your very first attempt. That is merely ridiculous. Did you feel anything as I read your mind? Harry shook his head, now blushing furiously. Then pay closer attention next time. The goal is not to create a perfect image on your first day of lessons. The goal is to learn where your surfaces are. Prepare yourself. Harry tried to pretend to be Kimball Kinnison again, tried to pay more attention, but his thoughts were a little scattered and he was suddenly aware of all the things he shouldn't be thinking about. Oh, this was going to suck. At least the instructor would be obliviated afterward. In a white room, windowless, featureless, sitting before a desk, facing an expressionless man in formal robes of solid black. It was their fourth day on a Sunday evening. When you paid this much, you got your sessions any darn time you wanted, never mind the concept of weekends. Hello, Mr. Potter. Hello, Mr. Bester. Let's just get the initial shock out of the way, shall we? You managed to surprise me. Well, then... Legilimens. There was a pause, and then the black-robed man jerked as if someone had touched him with a cattle prod. 
The Dark Lord is alive. Dumbledore turns himself invisible and sneaks into the girls' dorm rooms? So, you genuinely believe you're going to discover the secret rules of magic and become all-powerful. That's right, I'm that overconfident. I wonder. It seems the Sorting Hat thinks you'll be the next Dark Lord. And you know I'm trying pretty hard not to be, and you saw that we already had a long discussion about whether you were willing to teach me Occlumency, and in the end you decided to do it. So can we just get this over with? Very well said the man exactly six seconds later, same as last time. Prepare yourself. Though I do wish I could remember that trick with the gold and silver. Harry was finding himself very disturbed by how reproducible human thoughts were when you reset people back to the same initial conditions and exposed them to the same stimuli. It was dispelling illusions that a good reductionist wasn't supposed to have in the first place. Harry was in a rather bad mood as he stomped out of his herbology class the next Monday morning. Hermione was seething alongside him. The other children were still inside, a bit slow to assemble their things because they were gibbering excitedly to each other about Ravenclaw winning the year's second Quidditch match. It seemed that last night after dinner, a girl had flown around on a broomstick for 30 minutes and then caught some sort of giant mosquito. There were other facts about what had happened during this match, but they were irrelevant. We should kill them! Who? The Quidditch team? I was thinking of everyone involved in any way with Quidditch anywhere, but the Ravenclaw team would be a start, yes! You do know that killing people is wrong, Harry? Yes. Okay, just checking. Let's get the secret first. I've read some Agatha Christie mysteries. Do you know how we can get her onto a train? Two students plotting murder. How shocking. From around a nearby corner strolled a man in lightly spotted robes, his greasy hair falling long and unkempt about his shoulders. Without thinking about it at all, Harry stepped in front of Hermione. There was an intake of breath from behind him, and then a moment later, Hermione brushed past and stepped in front of him. Run, Harry! Boys shouldn't have to be in danger. Amusing. I request a moment of your time, Potter, if you can tear yourself away from your flirtations with Miss Granger. Oh, don't worry, Miss Granger. I promise to return your bow unmaimed. Now, Potter and I are about to go off and have a private conversation, just by ourselves. I hope it is clear that you are not invited, but just in case, consider that an order from a Hogwarts professor. I'm sure a good little girl like you won't disobey. And Severus turned and walked back around the corner. Um, can I just sort of go off and follow him and let you work out what I should say to make sure you're not all worried and offended? No. Coming, Potter. Sorry. Really. And he went off after the potions master. I don't suppose you could explain... Why the two of you were plotting to murder Cho Chang? I don't suppose you could explain, in your capacity as an official of the Hogwarts school system, why catching a golden mosquito is deemed an academic accomplishment worthy of a hundred and fifty house points? Dear me, and I thought you were supposed to be perceptive. Are you truly so incapable of understanding your classmates, Potter? Or do you dislike them too much to try? If Quidditch scores did not count toward the House Cup, then none of them would care about house points at all. It would merely be an obscure contest for students like you and Miss Granger. It was a shockingly good answer. And that shock brought Harry's mind fully awake. In retrospect, it shouldn't have been surprising that Severus understood his students, understood them very well indeed. He had been reading their minds. And... The book said that a successful Agilimens was extremely rare, rarer than a perfect Occlumens, because almost no one had enough mental discipline. Mental discipline? Harry had collected stories about a man who routinely lost his temper in class and blew up at young children. 
But the same man, when Harry had spoken of the Dark Lord still being alive, had responded instantly and perfectly, reacting in precisely the way that someone completely ignorant would react. The man stalked about Hogwarts with the air of an assassin, radiating danger, which was exactly not what a real assassin should do. Real assassins should look like meek little accountants until they killed you. He was the head of house for a proud and aristocratic Slytherin, and he wore a robe which was spotted with stains from bits of potions and ingredients which two minutes of magic could have removed. Harry noticed that he was confused, and his threat estimate of the head of House Slytherin shot up astronomically. Dumbledore had seemed to think Severus was his, and there'd been nothing to contradict that. The potions master had been scary but not abusive, as promised. So, Harry had reasoned earlier, this was fellowship business. If Severus had been planning harm, surely he wouldn't have come to get Harry in front of Hermione, a witness, when he could have simply waited for some time when Harry was alone. Harry quietly bit his lip. Looking me in the eyes, Potter? Your occlumency lessons cannot have progressed far enough for you to block legitimacy. But then... Perhaps they have progressed far enough for you to detect it. Since I cannot know otherwise, I will not risk trying. And the same will hold for Dumbledore, I think. Which is why we are now having this little talk. To begin with, I should like you to promise not to speak of our conversations to anyone. So far as the school is concerned, we are discussing your potions homework. Whether or not they believe it is unimportant. So far as Dumbledore and McGonagall are concerned, I am violating Draco Malfoy's confidences in me, and neither of us think it proper to speak further of the particulars. All right, I promise. It was hard to see how having a conversation and being unable to tell anyone could be more constraining than not having it, in which case you also couldn't tell anyone the contents. You said once in the headmaster's office that you would not tolerate bullying or abuse. And so I wonder, Harry Potter, just how much do you resemble your father? Unless we're talking about Michael Varys Evans, the answer is that I know very little about James Potter. There is a fifth-year Slytherin, a boy named Lysoth Lestrange. He is being bullied by Gryffindors. I am constrained in my ability to deal with such situations. You could help him, perhaps, if you wished. I am not asking you for a favor and will not owe you one. It is simply an opportunity to do as you will. Wondering if it's a trap? It is not. It is a test. Call it curiosity on my part. But Lasoth's troubles are real, as are my own difficulties in intervening. That was the trouble with other people knowing you were a good guy. Even if you knew they knew, you still couldn't ignore the bait. And if his father had protected students from bullies too, it didn't matter if Harry knew why Severus had told him, it still made him feel warm inside, and proud, and made it impossible to walk away. Fine, tell me about Lasoth. Why is he being bullied? Lysoth Lestrange is the son of Bellatrix Black, the most fanatic and evil servant of the Dark Lord. Lysoth is the acknowledged bastard of Rostaban Lestrange. Shortly after the Dark Lord's death, Bellatrix and Rostaban, and Rostaban's brother Rodolphus, were captured while torturing Alice and Frank Longbottom. All three are in Azkaban for life. The Longbottoms were driven insane by repeated cruciatus and remain in St. Mungo's incurable ward. Is any of that a good reason to bully him, Potter? It is no reason at all. And Lasoth himself has done no wrong that you know? He is no more saint than anyone else. I did not invade his privacy, Potter. I looked within the Gryffindors, rather. He is simply a convenient target for their little satisfactions. A cold wash of anger ran down Harry's spine, and then he had to remind himself that Severus might not be a trustworthy source of information. And you think that an intervention by Harry Potter, the boy who lived, 
might prove effective. Indeed, said Severus Snape, and told Harry when and where the Gryffindors were planning their next little game. Four boys in red-trimmed robes are laughing, and a boy in green-trimmed robes is screaming as the four boys make as though to push him out. It's just a joke, of course, and besides, a fall from that height wouldn't kill a wizard. All good fun. If you think there's anything odd about this... What are you doing? says a sixth boy's voice. Stop it! The four boys in red-trimmed robes spin around with sudden starts. Um, you do know who this is. Lesoth Lestrange, and he didn't do anything to my parents. He was five years old. Why are you defending him? He's a Slytherin, and a Lestrange. He's a boy who lost his parents. I know how that is. He didn't know where the words had come from. It sounded too cool, like something Harry Potter would say. Who do you think you are? I think he's a traitor. And there was a sudden sinking sensation in Neville's stomach. He'd known it. He'd just known it. Harry Potter had been wrong after all. Bullies wouldn't stop only because Neville Longbottom told them to stop. So, that's how it is for you. It doesn't matter to you if it's Lysoth Lestrange or Neville Longbottom. Evil is evil. And if you're friends with evil, you're evil too. Friends. Yes, I have friends. One of them is the boy who lived. Harry Potter isn't here. And if he was, I don't think he'd like to see a Longbottom defending a Lestrange. Harry James Potter Evans Varus. Harry James Potter Evans Varus. Harry James Potter Evans Varus. By the debt that you owe me and the power of your true name, I summon you. I open the way for you. I call upon you to manifest yourself before me. Neville snapped his fingers. <sniffs> Lysoth Lestrange was staring at him. The four Gryffindors were staring at him. Was Harry Potter supposed to step around the corner or something? Ah, looks like you've been stood up. Ahem, said Harry Potter from behind them in the dead end of the hallway where nobody could possibly have gotten to without being seen. Harry Potter stalked forward, placing himself between Lysoth Lestrange and the others. Mr. Carl Sloper, I believe I have comprehended the situation fully. If Lysoth Lestrange has ever committed a single evil himself, rather than being born to the wrong parents, the fact is not known to you. If I am mistaken in this, Mr. Sloper, I suggest you inform me at once. But he's a Lestrange. He's a boy who lost his parents. So, you saw that Neville didn't want you tormenting an innocent boy on behalf of the Longbottoms. This failed to move you. If I tell you that the boy who lived also thinks you are in the wrong, that what you did today was a terrible mistake, does that make a difference? Carl, maybe we should go. They say you're going to be the next Dark Lord. They also say I'm secretly betrothed to Geneva Weasley and there's a prophecy about us conquering France. Since you're determined to force the issue, Mr. Carl Sloper, let me make things clear. Leave Lesoth alone. I will know if you don't. So Leslie snarked to you. Sure. And he also told me what you did today after you left Charms class, in a private secluded place where no one could see you, with a certain Hufflepuff girl wearing a white ribbon in her hair. Eep! said one of the other Gryffindors in a high-pitched voice, and spun on his heels and ran around the corner. And then there were six. Ah, there goes a slightly intelligent young man. The rest of you could stand to learn from Bertram Kirk's example before you get into, shall we say, trouble. Are you threatening to snark on us? Bad things happen to snarkers. Oh, you did not just say that. Are you really trying to intimidate me? Me? Now honestly, do you think you're scarier than Peregrine Derrick? Severus Snape, or for that matter, you know who? See, this is where I snap my fingers and you become part of a hilariously amusing story that will be told with much nervous laughter at dinner tonight. But the thing is, people I trust keep telling me not to do that. Professor McGonagall told me I was taking the easy way out of everything, and Professor Quirrell says I need to learn how to lose. So you remember that story where I let myself get beaten up by some older Slytherins? We could do that. You could bully me for a while, and I could let you. Only you remember that part at the end where I tell my many, many friends inside the school not to do anything about it? 
This time we'll skip that part. So go ahead. Bully me. The three Gryffindors broke and ran. There was silence as their footsteps faded, and then more silence after that. And then there were three. That was really cool. You were pretty cool too, you know. Neville knew that Harry Potter was just saying that, trying to make him feel good, and it still started a warm glow inside his chest. Are you okay, Lestrange? Lestrange Lestrange turned slowly and stared at Neville, his face tight, no longer crying, tears glistening as they dried. You think you know how it is? You think you know? My parents are an Azkaban! I try not to think about it and they always remind me. They think it's great that Mother is there in the cold and the dark with the Dementor sucking away her life. I wish I was like Harry Potter. At least his parents aren't hurting. My parents are always hurting. Every second of every day. I wish I was like you. At least you can see your parents sometimes. At least you know they loved you. If Mother ever loved me, the Dementors will have eaten that thought by now. Lasoth turned to Harry Potter. Help me, Lord. They say you can do anything. Please, please, my lord. Get my parents out of Azkaban. I'll be your loyal servant forever. My life will be yours and my death as well. Only please. Lasoth, I can't. I can't really do things like that. It's all just stupid tricks. It's not. I saw it. The stories are true. You can. Lasoth, I set the whole thing up with Neville. We planned it all out in advance. Ask him. You son of a mudblood! You could get her out! You just won't! I should have known! You're the boy who lived! You think she belongs there! I can't! It's not a question of what I want! I don't have the power! Lasoth turned and walked away. When he was around the corner, the sound of his feet sped up, and as they faded, Neville thought he heard a single sob. And then there were two. Wow... He didn't seem very grateful for being rescued. He thought I could help him. He had hope for the first time in years. I'm sorry. What? I wasn't grateful when you helped me. Every single thing you said was completely right. No, it wasn't. Harry had turned from Neville and was staring at the window. A completely ridiculous thought came to Neville. Are you feeling guilty because you can't get Lasoth's parents out of Azkaban? No. A few seconds went by. Yes. Do you have to do literally anything anyone asks you? The boy who lived turned back and looked at Neville again. Do? No. Feel guilty about not doing? Yes. Once the Dark Lord died, Bellatrix Black was literally the most evil person in the entire world. And that was before she went to Azkaban. Even so... There might be some incredibly clever solution that makes it possible to save everyone and let them all live happily ever after. And if only I was smart enough, I would have thought of it by now. You have problems. You think you ought to be what Lesoth Lestrange thinks you are. Yeah, that pretty much nails it. Every time someone cries out in prayer and I can't answer, I feel guilty about not being God. That doesn't sound good. I understand that I have a problem, and I know what I need to do to solve it, alright? I'm working on it. Harry watched Neville leave. Of course, Harry hadn't said what the solution was. The solution, obviously, was to hurry up and become God. Neville's footsteps moved off and soon could no longer be heard. And then there was one. Ahem. The tall, greasy man in the spotted robes was in the same position Harry had occupied. A fine invisibility cloak, Potter. Much is explained. And perhaps I have been in Dumbledore's company too long, but I cannot help but wonder if that is THE cloak of invisibility. Harry immediately turned into someone who'd never heard of the cloak of invisibility and who was exactly as smart as Harry thought Severus thought Harry was. Oh, possibly. I trust you realize the implications if it is. You have no idea what I'm talking about, do you, Potter? A rather clumsy try at fishing. Professor Quirrell had remarked over their lunch that Harry really needed to conceal his state of mind better than putting on a blank face when someone discussed a dangerous topic. 
and had explained about one-level deception, two-level deceptions, and so on. So either Severus was, in fact, modeling Harry as a one-level player, which made Severus himself two-level, and Harry's three-level move had been successful, or Severus was a four-level player and wanted Harry to think the deception had been successful. Harry, smiling, had asked Professor Quirrell what level he played at, and Professor Quirrell, also smiling, had responded, One level higher than you. So you were watching this whole time. Disillusionment, I think it's called. It would have been foolish of me to take the slightest risk that you came to harm. And you wanted to see the results of your test firsthand. So, am I like my father? A strange, sad expression came over the man, one that looked foreign to his face. I should sooner say, Mr. Potter, that you resemble... Severus stopped short. He stared at Harry. Lestrange called you a son of a mudblood. It didn't seem to bother you much. Not under those circumstances, no. You just helped him, and he threw it back in your face. Surely that isn't something you just forgive. He'd just been through a pretty harrowing experience. And I don't think being rescued by first years helped his pride much either. I suppose it was easy enough to forgive. Since Lestrange means nothing to you. Just some strange Slytherin. If it was a friend, perhaps, you would have felt far more injured by what he said. If he were a friend, all the more reason to forgive him. There was a long silence. Harry felt, and he couldn't have said why or from where, that the air was filling up with a dreadful tension, like water rising and rising and rising. You are a very forgiving person. I suppose your stepfather, Michael Varys Evans, was the one who taught it to you. More like Dad's science fiction and fantasy collection. Sort of my fifth parent, really. I've lived the lives of all the characters in all my books, and all their mighty wisdom thunders in my head. Somewhere in there was someone like Lasoth, I expect, though I couldn't say who. It wasn't hard to put myself in his shoes, and it was my books that told me what to do about it, too. The good guys forgive. I'm afraid I wouldn't know much about what good people do. I should like to ask your advice about something. I know of another fifth-year Slytherin who was being bullied by Gryffindors. He was wooing a beautiful muggle-born girl, who came across him being bullied and tried to rescue him. And he called her a mudblood, and that was the end for them. He apologized many times, but she never forgave him. Have you any thoughts for what he could have said or done to win from her the forgiveness you gave Lestrange? Mmm... Based on only that information, I'm not sure he was the main one who had a problem. I'd have told him not to date someone that incapable of forgiveness. Suppose they'd gotten married. Can you imagine life in that household? Oh, but she could forgive. Why, afterward, she went off and became the girlfriend of the bully. Tell me, why would she forgive the bully and not the bullied? At a wild guess, because the bully had hurt someone else very badly, and the bullied had hurt her just a little. And to her, that felt far more unforgivable somehow. Or, not to put too fine a point on it, was the bully handsome? Or for that matter, rich? Yes, to both. And there you have it. Not that I've ever been through high school myself, but my books give me to understand that there's a certain kind of teenage girl who'll be outraged by a single insult if the boy is plain or poor, yet who can somehow find room in her heart to forgive a rich and handsome boy his bullying. She was shallow, in other words. Tell whoever it was that she wasn't worthy of him and he needs to get over it and move on, and next time date girls who are deep instead of pretty. Um, not that I've got any experience in the area myself, obviously, but I think that's what a wise advisor from my books would say. I think that there should be no more conversations between us, Potter, and you would be exceedingly wise never to speak of this one. Would you mind telling me what I did wrong? You offended me, and I no longer trust your cunning. In the future, never share your wisdom with anyone unless you know exactly what you are both talking about. Your father was the bully. 
and what your mother saw in him was something I never did understand until this day. Your books betrayed you, Potter. They did not tell you the one thing you needed to know. You cannot learn from stories what it is like to lose the one you love. That is something you could never understand without feeling it yourself. Goodbye, Potter. We shall have little to say to each other from today on. He left. Harry turned and walked toward the window. Never give anyone wise advice unless you know exactly what you're both talking about. Got it. But there was a tight feeling in Harry's chest, like it was being compressed by metal bands. So his father had been a bully, and his mother had been shallow. Maybe they'd grown up later. Good people like Professor McGonagall did seem to think the world of them, and it might not be only because they were heroic martyrs. Of course, that was scant consolation when you were eleven and about to turn into a teenager and wondering what sort of teenager you might become. So very terrible. So very sad. Such an awful life Harry led. Learning that his genetic parents hadn't been perfect, why, he ought to spend a while moping about that, feeling sorry for himself. Maybe he could complain to Lysoth Lestrange. Harry had read about Dementors. Cold and darkness surrounded them, and fear. They sucked away all your happy thoughts, and in that absence, all your worst memories rose to the surface. He could imagine himself in Lasoth's shoes, knowing that his parents were in Azkaban for life, that place from which no one had ever escaped. And Lasoth would be imagining himself in his mother's place, in the cold and the darkness and the fear, alone with all of her worst memories, even in her dreams, every second of every day. For an instant, Harry imagined his own mum and dad in Azkaban, with the Dementors sucking out their life, draining away the happy memories of their love for him. Just for an instant, before his imagination blew a fuse and called an emergency shutdown, and told him never to imagine that again. Was it right to do that to anyone? Even the second most evil person in the world? No, said the wisdom in Harry's books. Not if there's any other way any other way at all. And unless the wizarding justice system was as perfect as their prisons, and that sounded rather improbable all things considered, somewhere in Azkaban was a person who was entirely innocent, and probably more than one. There was a burning sensation in Harry's throat and moisture gathering in his eyes, and he wanted to teleport all of Azkaban's prisoners to safety and call down fire from the sky and blast that terrible place down to bedrock. But he couldn't because he wasn't God. And Harry remembered what Professor Quirrell had said beneath the starlight. Sometimes, when this flawed world seems unusually hateful, I wonder whether there might be some other place, far away, where I should have been. But the stars are so very, very far away, and I wonder what I would dream about if I slept for a long, long time. Right now, this flawed world seemed unusually hateful. And Harry couldn't understand Professor Quirrell's words. It might have been an alien that had spoken, or an artificial intelligence. You couldn't leave your home planet while it still contained a place like Azkaban. You had to stay and fight. <laughs>